Hello everyone. Happy almost Valentine's Day. Uh, can everybody hear me okay out there? Ooh, windy and chilly in Kansas, Joyce says. Yeah, this has not been good weather across the country, has it? Yikes. Um, thank you guys for being here though, despite the uh, the blizzards. I'm hoping everybody has power this time. Has there been any power outages like there was the last big storm? Oh, you guys are noticing. Yep, my daughter talked me into taking the plunge. I cut off lots of hair. <laughs> I scared you. Well, that's what you get for not paying attention. <laughs> Thanks, guys. It was a big step for me. It's hard for me to cut off inches of my hair. But it was time. Yeah, it was time. Yes, and where's Beth? Beth has been nagging me to do this for a while. So I took Beth's advice. She always likes that. And yeah, well, yeah, I got. So I have somebody. Oh, should I say in studio? <laughs> no, we don't have a studio. You know, you guys know this is my home office. But I have a little visitor. Let me see if I can show you. Oh, here's our little visitor. But she sound. Well, oh, she just opened her eyes. <laughs> so let me see if I can get this put back here. All right. So. Uh, you guys who follow me on Facebook know that I, I drove to Southern California where my daughters live and spent a few days there. I went to the SoCal meetup um, where Griff and Lee were there. I'm telling you guys, if you're not involved in a meetup group, you need to find one. And if there's not one around you, maybe think about starting one. Um, when Griff comes out to these types of events, he talks a lot more than he does on the radio. Let's just say that. <laughs> we get him to say stuff that he would never say on a recording. Um, but yeah, it was a really, I mean, he went on for, oh gosh, a good two plus hours just talking about eBay and things about eBay and what's going on with eBay and the future of eBay as much as he could divulge. He's still, he has to stay pretty secretive, you know, about some things, um, but he does give a lot of hints, information. A um, couple things that I took away from that were that you, if uh, first of all, let me ask you in the chat room, how many of you do not have an eBay store? Who do, does not have an eBay store? I'm kind of looking for answers. Okay, Joyce does not. Few of you. Okay, I am going to tell you, based on what I heard Wednesday night, you may want to seriously consider getting an eBay store by March. Now, I don't know details, but there's something big that is going to be happening with the spring changes. Because, you know, eBay does these this big bucket list of changes, um, one in the spring, one in the fall. And um, there's been a lot of discussion about how important stores are. I think stores are vital to an eBay business anyway, whether or not there was going to be any changes. Stores are really, really important if you are really taking your eBay business serious and treating it like a business because it's more than just whatever discount on listing fees or whatever. There are marketing and branding opportunities with a store that you don't have if you're just you know, putting up merchandise. So there is, there's something big in the works. And I don't know. I, I honestly don't know what it is yet. But the way Griff was talking about it, you're going to want a store when these changes take place. Let's just say that. It's a biggie. That's a biggie. Um, we talked a little bit about Cassini the new search engine that eBay is rolling out. How many of you are liking the way you're getting search results now on eBay? Let's see what the consensus is here in the chat room. 
Remember, keep it clean. It's a family show. <laughs> okay, so good. Like it? Really? You like it? I have to tell you, I'm a little frustrated. I am frustrated as I'm researching listings to find results and I'm really turning more towards third-party softwares to do my research. I am not liking it for researching. Yeah, so those of you who like it, you're liking it for searching for things to buy. Okay, interesting. Very interesting to hear that. Um, so we talked a little bit about Cassini and uh, Griff basically said that he that's one thing that he has chosen not to know a lot about. He did ask one of the head people in that department um, because he needs to know what to advise sellers and so he needed to know enough to be able to tell his listeners and his view and his you know people that email him for advice what they should do to be up to date with Cassini and the person that, that answered him said absolutely nothing best practices are still best practices so now if you guys have followed me for a while you know that I don't write my titles for eBay I don't I don't even think about what is really best for eBay search, I am still writing my titles for what's best for Google search because eBay is confined to just whoever's on eBay. But if you write your titles for the Google search engine, you are reaching everybody. So that's where I stay. And I figure if I'm writing good for Google, it should work well with Cassini and eBay and, and all of that. And so far, so good. Um, so getting some comments going. I'm just going through and reading some. So Terry he says, it scares me when I can't see my own active or sold listings and makes me wonder what else I can't see. I know, huh? Um, you know, Cassini is supposed to narrow things down for the potential buyer, which actually I can see that as a good thing. In the general, per, you know, in the big picture of conversion, meaning people who come to eBay search for something and then turning them into buyers. So I see this, that's the number one goal that's on eBay's mind. So I see this as a good thing because I bet most of you can agree that if you have too many choices, you get overwhelmed, you kind of maybe just back off and end up not making a decision at all. Anybody with me on that? I'm kind of like that. You put too many choices in front of me, my brain gets all fuzzy. Anybody with me on that one? Yeah, exactly. There you go. So I think what Cassini's trying to do is narrow down based on that particular registered eBay users patterns they're trying to narrow in what they think is going to result in conversion meaning they're going to click over and they're going to buy so this could be a good thing really good thing for eBay not so good if you don't meet all the criteria that puts your item in front of that potential buyer so that's what you know we kind of deal with but there's way too much to it for you guys to even worry about all the little things that you would need to do to be on that page. Um, so how do you know if your titles are good for Google search? Glad you asked. Um, so one of the, the biggest, biggest rules of thumb, concentrate on your first five to six words. Make sure those first five to six words are the most important relevant words in that title. For instance, if you have something, and I'm looking around my desk, I don't have anything that kind of like fits. Um, if something with a brand name or a maker or an artist or a pattern name, you make sure that that is up in your first five or six words. Um, the, the, the very specific of what something is, and I'm again looking on my desk. So I showed you guys this. So I have, let's say this it's wood and it's a carved bear. So it's an ironwood carved bear. 
Those three words right there, most important to get into. So in other words, you wouldn't want to make your title pretty brown, one of a kind, awesome, unique, carved wood bear. You want to put carved wood bear, ironwood, brown, you know, so you want to get those most important words, the ones that somebody's most likely to put into the search engine up front in your titles. Because, you know, think about the little spiders are going out and, and scanning through your listing. They're scanning those words and coming up, oh, there it is. That's what I was looking for, and it came up really fast. So just think about that. Think about... What is somebody going to call this right off the bat? Go with your gut instinct. If I hold up this bowl, what's the first words that come to your mind on this bowl? Somebody throw them out. I'm waiting. There we go. Blue. Ooh, you see pineapple in that? Hmm, that's interesting. So, okay, so this is what I was hoping. So you see in the chat room, blue bowl. Blue bowl was like the first thing that came to your mind, so I'm definitely going to want to put blue bowl in, you know what I'm saying? So that's kind of how Google works. Find those most relevant, important keywords, put them at the very front. Even if it doesn't make grammatical sense, because you're not writing a grammar lesson, you are writing words that is going to bring up, because what happens is somebody types a phrase into a search engine, such as, uh, and this is pottery. So they type in blue pottery bowl. They didn't write in blue pottery bowl maker. I still don't know the maker on this yet, so I can't tell you. And all of that first. Although if they, bad choice, because if I find the maker, obviously that's going to go first. Um, but then they're going to get these results. Do you think they're going to be looking at the titles of those results first or pictures, gallery pictures. Exactly, exactly. They're not going to be reading the titles anymore. Yeah, they're, I mean, the, the eye is going to see the words in that title, but you're really writing those words for the search engines not so much the person looking at the stuff because once the results of their search comes up they are looking at pictures I can guarantee it and guarantee it they're looking at pictures and then they may skim the title and see what's there but that's that's how people are shopping now pictures pictures and we all say it come on we all say buyers don't read and you know what they don't they look at that picture and think, oh, that is exactly what I wanted. Yeah, they might skim, look at condition and a couple things. They don't read. They look at pictures now. That's why Pinterest took off like wildfire because people are picture, visual oriented because it's fast. It's easy. It's, it stirs up emotions. It's, it's how they want to shop. Absolutely. Absolutely. So... That's how you write your titles for Google. Okay, so um, I had a couple people saying that, you know, they would have forgotten about the show without the reminder that, that kind of goes out on Facebook. And let me just tell you, we schedule these shows at the beginning of a month, and we schedule the whole month's worth of shows. So if you guys just go into the Ask the Danny App channel, you'll see all the upcoming shows, and you can RSVP. And once you RSVP to that show, you'll get a reminder before the show starts. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, we record this and put the archives over on iTunes, which of course is just audio, but it's another place where you can catch up and listen. And you can also go see the show over on YouTube, because we put it over on YouTube. And it's also over on my website, uh, which is thedannyapp.com, of course. All right, so lots of places to find the archive shows and get reminders. Um, so I got back from California last night. Yeah, we got back last night. Whew. And so you, you guys might have seen my little dilemma I'm going through right now. So how many of you have ever like 
gotten in the car to take a trip and just have that nagging feeling like you forgot something. Everybody get that? Yeah, well, usually I do. Guess what happened this time? I didn't get that nagging feeling and I left probably the most important thing that I could leave behind. I left my laptop. No, I didn't know. All the thrifted stuff came home. I left my laptop computer and what I do when I'm traveling is I put all of my most important stuff into the laptop case because I, I'll never leave my laptop behind, right? Yeah. The laptop's still sitting in California with my appointment calendar which has all my daily to-do lists in it and everything coming up for the week. Um, all, my medications, my, you name it. It's in that laptop case. Now I'm kind of like, I'm panicking just a little bit. <laughs> so I'm trying to get my, uh, my, my other daughter to take a little whirlwind trip out here and bring it for me because I don't want to ship it. I don't want to ship all that important stuff. You know, it's just, that scares me. Will if I have to, but it's a last resort. Plus, see, I've been doing something really fun. Well, okay, so it's not been so fun. I'm looking over at my daughter. She's like, yeah, not so fun. <laughs> so we've been going through all of my unlisted inventory. You guys have heard me talking how I need to raise my price point. I need to only sell stuff that's worth $50 and more, or at least have the potential to sell for that much. And so we have been going through all of my crates of stuff and purge, putting stuff into a yard sale pile or putting stuff into send home with the daughter or send home with my mom who's coming out tomorrow. Um, I'm really like giving stuff up. I'm really, I, I'm proud of myself because I've got it down to less unlisted stuff than stuff I put into those other piles. So I've been doing a really good job. It's hard though. So how many of you will confess that you have way too much unlisted inventory? Let's see who's willing to be honest over here. All right, thank you. Thank you for your honesty. No shame. You know why? We all know it. The shopping is the fun part. It's totally the fun part. Totally the fun part. But how many of you actually need to make money from this business? Anybody really need that income? Need to be profitable? If I use the H word, you're leaving. <laughs> that was used on me a couple times today, Beth. I got I got called that by my daughter a few times. Cause, okay, so when I bought all this stuff, I bought it because it was great stuff for resale. And every time she'd say, Mom, you need to get rid of this. I'm like, but, but, but this is, I could... No, no, I have to stop that because there is no way on earth I can get all this stuff listed unless I hire a crew of like three people in here, you know, for a few days to list it all, which isn't going to happen. Um, so yeah, there's just, I got to let it go because <sighs> there's always more stuff, always more stuff. This is not the first time in my life I've had to tell myself this. I have, I'm not as bad now as I used to be. Let me just say that. I've had to leave a whole garage full of stuff behind on one of my moves. You know, it's been quite a few years. But I have to tell myself, there is always going to be more stuff to sell. And having all of this unlisted inventory is costing my business money. It is making me not profitable if you count up all those dollars that are sitting on the floor unlisted. I cannot justify going out and getting more stuff. It doesn't make sense. I know a lot of us are in the same boat. 
So Beth says she's so sick of people saying hoarder. Here's her theory. If I were Macy's, this would be the warehouse. No one would say hoarder, so knock it off. Well, but, Beth, but, that's true, but we're not Macy's. We're not Macy's. And if we are just stockpiling stuff and justifying that this is worth this and this is worth this, we're not doing ourselves any favor. We're not making ourselves profitable because there's no way we should be going out and spending more money on more stuff when we don't have the stuff that we have listed. And I, I'm raising my hand. I am so guilty, so guilty. Ask me what I did in California when shopping. And it's really funny because we swore we were not going to go shopping. We swore we weren't going to do it. We were going to get my daughter's house all put together. Now, I got to tell you, my daughter does not have all of this back stock of unlisted stuff. I don't know if you can hear her. She says she never buys more than she lists, than she lists what she has which is how we all should kind of be functioning. My goal, my goal is to get all caught up on all this stuff now that's on, in one set of shelves that needs to be listed and only buy more when I'm down to just a few things left to do so that I'm always got, it's fresh in my mind, it's freshly purchased and I remember the story behind it, I remember what I paid for it because I've got stuff I've forgotten what I paid for it I forgot like the story behind it and sometimes and yeah I found a few things like this today the trend has passed it was a hot hot item when I bought it and I've waited so long to get it listed it's not hot anymore you know now it's just run of the mill you know it'll still sell but not worth it so yeah so I'm 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 kind of there you know so if anybody wants to take that challenge with me anybody want to raise your hand Take that challenge with me. Don't buy anything else so you get your stuff listed. Seeing if anybody's with me. Yay! I've got some on board with me. Now, what I've been doing though is I'm purging. Like I said, there's like, I've got four tubs ready to go out to my yard sale. So I'll still get my money back. I, it's not that I'm going to lose money. It's just that it's not worth my time to deal with all of that stuff that's no longer worth the $20 and under price range. And I'm really shooting for the $50 and up. Now I did keep items that like I have several of the same, either the same thing or similar thing. Now that's my other rule of thumb. So I'm looking on my shelf here and I've got, I've got six pairs of Angry Bird slippers. Now, they're not worth 50 bucks a piece. They're maybe worth 20 bucks a piece. But because I have six of them, that meets my $50 criteria. Or, like, here's an item that I'm putting up. And I'm going to talk more about these. These little boxes, I have five of them. They're not worth 50 bucks a piece, but they were sell similar, sell similar, sell similar. So, worth my time. And that's where I'm kind of like now moving my mind into is it's got to either be a sell similar or it's got to be worth 50 bucks to make the money so there you go <sighs> I know it's been a rough day it's been a rough day we've been working on this all day and I'm I've been wrestling I'm because I can justify keeping anything but I can't do it because then I do feel like a hoarder and I feel like ugh, no I can't keep all this stuff it's not good no so I'm right there I'm right there with you guys. I'm right there. Totally. Now, I also, this weekend, um, on Friday, I got to go shopping with one of the masters of not keeping stuff hanging around very long. And I'm going to talk more about that a little bit. Um, but how many of you know Tim Chapman, Mr. Customer Service? You know, I always thought, oh my gosh, how can he do that? He's selling that stuff too cheap. But we're going to talk more about that in a little bit because I got to go shopping with him. I got to go shopping with him. He's a really, really fun guy. All right. Whew. So enough of that rough topic of having to get rid of stuff. I know. That kind of like sends the shivers through many of us. 
<laughs> but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Um, so I want to take a minute to kind of talk about our beloved sponsors. Um, Outright.com, you guys know, is a great place to start when it comes to keeping track of your numbers. Um, both the pluses and the minuses, they keep track of it all, and it's still free. There is an, an upgraded version, but it is still free. Um, would love it if you guys would visit Outright.com if you haven't already. Um, easy peasy. They import all of your eBay expenses and, and sales and all that good stuff for you. And it's a really great place to start if you need to get your bookkeeping under control. Oh, Deb, thank you for posting the link for, for Tim's store there, uh, Mr. Customer Service. I'll let April put that up on, on the screen for a minute there so you guys all can catch that. Yeah, he's a great guy. We're going we're gonna to talk more about Tim here in a little bit. I'll back in, into our, our sailing uh, section of the show. Promise. Got more stories to tell fun story he's very inspiring it's part of why I'm like so inspired like to do this um, so uh, everyone settling into the new postage rates everybody getting used to it customers getting used to it awesome yeah you know I gotta tell you I heard a lot of fears with uh, the international sales. A lot of fear with international sales. I haven't lost my international sales. They're still coming in as much as ever. Uh, they just know they have to pay more. You know, I, I... So some of you haven't had any international. Some of you have had more. Go figure. I personally, I have not lost any international sales. Yeah. So um, stamps.com's Eric Nash and uh, Mark Levine from BubbleFast.com put out a great webinar that discussed all the ins and outs of the of the postal rate changes. And I think uh, I think we have that link for you to put on screen. Let's see, there it is. All right. So uh, this is the webinar. You can go and check that out if you had. Um, any questions still about all those changes? They, they put that out there. Um, those that don't know, stamps.com. Uh, stamps.com does everything you can do at the post office. It's like they like to say, postage from your PC. Um, really great company. Love them. I have the paid version. Love the paid version. I can print everything down to a first class letter stamp um, from my thing. And for me, one saved trip to the post office. Totally worth the price. Totally worth it. Love stamps.com. Um, so they put out some really great information. They have a new rate guide. And let's see, I think I, April can put that up on the screen. So there's the new rate guide. You can print this out. It's a PDF file. Print it out. It's got all of the new prices and everything. So you have it at your fingertips when you're creating your listings and doing that. And, you know, when you do free shipping, you still need to know what your worst case scenario shipping is and everything. So everything's there for you. Um, so you can print that out. You can still get stamps.com for free uh, if you're an eBay seller. You can do all of your eBay shipping through stamps.com, which comes in really handy now that you can't print the parcel select from eBay. You can do this through stamps.com's free account. Um, so totally worth going and getting that account and having it handy for those packages that still need to go parcel select. Otherwise, you have to take your parcel, what was parcel post, you have to take those to the post office. Eh, don't do that. Go get your stamps.com account and just print it online as usual. They will take care of you. All right. And of course, Bubble Fast. So hearing really good things about Bubble Fast. Bubble Fast is your uh, shipping supplies. They have, you know, bubble... They're, they don't call it bubble wrap. It's bubble something. Because bubble wrap is a trademark name. Go figure. Um, so it's bubble bubble packaging. <laughs> bubble stuff. Let's call it bubble stuff. 
Um, they have that really high quality, guys. It's it's a little more expensive you might find than other sources. Much higher quality, you use less. They have all the poly bags in every size you can imagine. They have things like the Scotty Stuffer box, you know, that goes inside the padded flat rate envelopes. Tons of stuff over at Bubble Fast. And if you use the code Danny, D A N N I, from their website, not from their eBay store, from their website, you will get an additional 5% off your order. Now, the other cool thing if you order from Bubble Fast, you start accumulating what they call bubble bucks. Uh, every time you order, your bubble bucks accumulate to where you start getting credit back and being able to apply that to future orders. So another additional savings. So really great. I love Bubble Fast. Bubblefast.com. Okay, who wants to talk about some scores? Doo -doo, little drum roll. I miss all our sound effects. Still hoping they let us come back with those. So every Sunday, we run a really great scores thread over on the Facebook group. Um, over at the Facebook, it's the Danny app. And we're going to share some of those. Now, if you guys do share on the scores thread, I love that you add the backstory, meaning, you know, where you found it, what you paid for it, and any other little fun tidbit that goes with it. Now, also, that eBay is not sharing those best offer prices with us. Let us know what it actually sold for if it was uh, best offer. Really awesome. Okay, so Louise, she bought this mug at a uh, disabled veterans thrift. She bought it for 99 cents, and it's item number four zero zero four one zero four one eight seven nine four and you guys can pull that up um, this is actually a Starbucks mug for breast cancer put out in 2006 and it brought thirty eight dollars and eighty six cents it's almost forty dollars for a mug that she paid 99 cents for Starbucks stuff you guys pick up Starbucks stuff I, don't, I mean Shoot, even if it's not one of the really high sellers, just having that keyword going out there gets people to your store. There is a huge culture of Starbucks collectors. I don't know how that all started, but got to love them. So funny story, I we have a, a, a Vons here in town that we go grocery shopping at, and they have a Starbucks. They have, you know, one of the like in-store little things. <laughs> I don't know what, what do you call those? Um, kiosk or now it's bigger than a kiosk. Anyway, so they have products and I've always got to go and check out what mugs are there and like the retail prices. Not that I'm paying retail prices for any of these mugs, but in my brain, I'm like looking at what these originally sold for. So when I start finding them out there, I know. So they got a clearance bin. Okay, so I got to tell you, anytime I see clearance, my eyes like glaze and go a little bonkers and I'm pulled away from whatever I'm doing, much to my husband's chagrin, who, who's usually with me. So I go over to the clearance bin and they've got these, um, I guess they're like, uh, they're, they're the, the thermal, you know, what do you call it? The plastic, boy, I'm lost for words tonight. You guys know what I'm talking about. And there's three of them left in the bin. And my husband's going, oh, I need a new mug. I'm like, oh, heck no. You're not getting that. I'm going to sell these suckers. Because they were marked down, I think, to like $8 each. They were originally $39.95. That right there told me I'm scooping these suckers up. So what's funny is the original deal on these mugs was that you got free refills with this particular mug through the month of December or was it January January so I ended up letting him take one of the mugs on the condition that he, he I was forcing him to go refill the sucker every day <laughs> so he, he at least got his money's worth out of it because he was taking you know away my profit so I still have two of those to sell now even though you can't still get the refills there's going to be somebody who's going to want that mug in their collection because it's no longer available. So I have two of them to sell. 
really funny though we were fighting over those starbucks mugs i wanted i i went over to like the other section to go find him some little cheap mug because i didn't want him to take one of my starbucks ones but it's all good because he ended up getting the refill twice a day totally made it worth its money he got he got some good money for that <laughs> i'm getting stared at by a baby <laughs> Yeah, you, you can bring me this. Oh, Eric, here's my here's my buddy here. She's gonna she's gonna help me through the show here. All right, so Starbucks, pick up that Starbucks. There's Starbucks plush. There's Starbucks cups. There's Starbucks collectibles of all kinds. You guys, pick them up. <laughs> it's my grandbaby. <laughs> I know she's looking at the screen, going, "Yeah, who are you talking to?" All right, Christy. Christy bought this cardigan sweater set from, now we use the initial GCF. What is GCF? Can somebody tell me what GCF is? I'm not sure what GCF is. And she got it for $7. Uh, it's item number 2211877. Nobody knows what GCF is, huh? You guys, if you use these uh, acronyms and initials, you got to tell me what they stand for. <laughs> She's making faces at her mommy. Oh, no spit on camera. <laughs> okay, so she took a best offer on this. Oh, Goodwill Community Foundation. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Um, she sold this for a best offer of $131. $131 for a sweater. A sweater. Yeah. So, a little tip, you guys. You cannot see the best offers through regular eBay.com right now, but here's a little secret. If you go up to the address bar where you go to to, you know, see where you are, change.com to .ca. Just change the .com to .ca, hit enter, you will see. <laughs> what it's sold for. That puts you on to eBay Canada where they don't hide it. So that's your that's your little tip if you want to see what something's sold for. Yeah, just remember to put it back when you are shopping or you're going to get really confused. Really confused. But that's how you can see. All right. Many of you know my mom, Bobby Bushy, and she actually asked me about these and oh well knowing what it's sold for will help in your research you know if you see something that's like something that you're selling and if you don't know what it's sold for you're not really going to know uh, how realistic the pricing is so always good to know what something's sold for yeah you just need to know for your own research for researching to, to list stuff Okay, so my mom had the opportunity, uh, she found these off of Craigslist, and she asked me about them. There's, um, there was 13 or 14 of them, and they're these copper plaques, and they've got different designs, um, but she got all of them for $20. I said, oh yeah, that's a no-brainer. Pick them up. And this goes back to my, you know, my sell similar thing, even though they're not exactly the same. You list one, you change a few things, it's basically, you know, really, really quick to keep them listed. All right, so this one was item number 2711-4316-4181. All right, she sold this one for $39.95. Paid for all of them. Now... Any of them that sell, that is pure profit. Just ka-ching, 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 ka-ching. Now, I don't know. Was this one, uh, do you have more of the same design, Mom? 
and she says it took her less than an hour to list them all. Less than an hour to list them all. Love that. Nope, this is the only one she had of this one. Okay. So what happens when you have more than one of the same thing is, I mean, more than one of the same design is what that does in best match. That tells the best match engine this is a good item to put in front of people. Uh, so this is going to help those similar items sell. So if she had more of these listed, um, this is definitely something you'd want to do in a multi-quantity and say, you know, list two or three at a time together because then the search engine pushes you up, tells somebody, you know, this is a good item. Just on that one. All right. Our next item, Lisa. Lisa bought this. It's a Coralie. It's Coralie or Coralie? I think it's Coralie. Lay, because it's Hawaiian. It's a sculpture. Uh, she got it from an estate sale for $2. That's right. And it was item number 3605-8494-3220. If you guys want to pull this up. And go ahead and pull this up and look at it. Because I find these from time to time. And let me tell you a little story about, about Coralie. Um, this sold on a best offer for $35, and which is not bad for a $2 purchase, got to say. So what I found out about Coralie is it is, she's going back to her mommy. <laughs> she's squirming. Um, it is a, it is a man-made coral. So they actually, and it's, but it's not, it's not like a resin or a plastic. It's a cultured, um, and I'm trying to remember the story behind it, but it is very unique to Hawaii. They create this actually in, in tanks of salt water. Um, it's a really interesting story how they, they create this, this coralie, and it's uh, a simulated coral. And it's what they use in like the aquariums and stuff nowadays because real coral can no longer be harvested from the ocean. It's become endangered and you are no longer allowed to to bring that up from the uh, coral reefs like you used to. Um, coral used to be harvested in, in huge quantities and it was put into saltwater aquariums and, you know, it was just a given, hey, just, you know, go get some real coral. Uh, now... Not the case. You can still sell real coral. If you guys find real coral on the shelf, grab it. Because like I said, you cannot harvest coral anymore. Coral is becoming more and more scarce. It breaks. So it, you know, if it's a good piece and it's intact, it's going to be worth some money. Yeah, hang on to your coral or sell it because it's good stuff. Good stuff. And there's... So many different kinds of coral. So many different kinds of coral. I, it, it's amazing. There's some beautiful pieces of coral out there. Um, so now all you can get is, is the cultured coral like this. Oh, so Lois says um, red coral is sold by the gram. Yeah, it's considered... Um, it's, it's an endangered species. You can't harvest it, but you can sell it still if you if you come across it so it's not been taken away from us to sell it yet same thing as those abalone shells very very strict on the actual harvesting and hunting of abalone on the pacific coast so the uh, the abalone the 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 divers that go down and and get the abalone are not allowed to sell the shells it's a weird little policy law thing they got going there. So you you and I, we can still sell those abalone shells, but they have to come from a source outside of the actual person who did the harvesting of them. And it's very limited how much. is a certain season, and they can only get so much, and they're done. So abalone shells, I'm telling you guys, those are, those are good stuff to, to list and sell as well. Okay, since we're on an 
We're on an ocean theme now. Love ocean stuff. So we've got, uh, oh, this was mine. <laughs> I can read. Uh, this was one of my scores. Item number 36049700 And I bought this one. I'm sorry. I gave you the wrong number. You can look at that number. Um, but the actual one that sold was 22114095. 6712. This one sold. The other th number I gave you is another one that I bought at the same time. I bought both of these for $75. This particular one, this is a uh, sculpture and it's kind of a mixed metal. Not a real high quality brand. It's SPI and you'll see a lot of these out there. This is Blue Points Crab, is what this one was called. I sold this one for $150. Okay, paid for, done. The other sculpture that I have is about six times the size. Huge sculpture. And if anybody went over and looked, you'll see what I have that listed for. Um, did anybody take a look at that first item number I gave you? I didn't give April the link, my bad. I have that listed for $1,000. Now, what do you think I'm going to take on a best offer if it comes in? What would you guys take on a best offer? On something that you had listed for $1,000 that is now completely paid for. Bingo. You're going to take half price, you know, at least. Hey, I'm telling you, I, I would I would seriously have trouble turning down three or $400 at this point. Um, but absolutely, I'm so negotiable on that price, but I have three watchers. I have three people watching that sculpture because it's really cool. Actually, it's, uh, it's one I hesitate to sell because I really like it. But now that it's a Everything that it sells for is pure profit, and I just have to worry about the shipping, which is probably going to be about 50 bucks when all is said and done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do really good in, in, in taking an offer on that. Now, don't tell anybody, because I'd really like to get the $1,000. How did I decide what to sell it for? Well, I went over, I did a little research on um, that type of sculpture, and it's not something that everybody lists. Sellers veer away from big, bulky, heavy stuff. So that's kind of something that I look for because there's not hundreds of people selling the same thing. So I actually look for those things that are a little difficult to ship, but with really, really high profit margins, you know, such as, such as this piece. Uh, and it's really easier. Yeah, I've absolutely free shipping included. Absolutely, I do free shipping. Sets me apart from every other seller out there selling that similar item that, that's there because they're going to be charging, you know, $50, $60, $70 dollars in shipping. Not me. I will take it down to my local uh, ship and, um, pack and ship place. They will charge me about $20 to package it up. So they'll package it, have it all ready to go. All I have to do is print the UPS label done. It is less work than some of my smaller items that I have to do myself. So I will sell those big, bulky, heavy items all day long. Love them. Love them. Absolutely. Even if it costs me $100 to ship, I'm going to make tons of profit on that item. So you kind of have to keep that in mind, you know, when you're turning down things. Now, not all big, bulky, heavy things are worth listing and selling. You, it, 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 definitely matters on what your potential profit margin is in the item. Absolutely. I also sold this uh, soapstone carving this week. Uh, item number 36056171 There we go. And I bought this for $15 at a Savers. And I find these all the time. Soapstone carvings are everywhere. Now, this was, granted, a big one. This was a nice one. Um, so the bigger, more intricate they are, the better. Uh, I sold it for a best offer of $112.50. 
112.50. I will take that profit margin all day long. And they've already got it and left me positive feedback. So they're happy with it. So look for soapstone carvings. Soapstone carvings are really, really good sellers. Okay, so going back to my shopping trip with uh, Tim. So Tim has an eBay store, and uh, April had given us the link to that before. So he does have an eBay store. He lists very few things at fixed price. He does almost everything on auction, which always kind of drove me crazy. I'm like, ah, do you know how much more you could get for this stuff? But here's his business model. He doesn't have any place to store stuff. So he needs to turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it, and get it out of there. So the way he shops is, and he's, and he's almost strictly estate sales. He loves estate sales because you get your higher quality items. He has built up his presence in the estate sale community that it goes to. I mean, everybody knows him. Uh, the, the dealers, you know, the people that run the estate sales, they know him. He's very well liked. And so he goes to the sales finds some really great stuff and negotiates a price. He gets everything listed right away. I mean, and he listed at auction and he may not get the absolute premium price on everything, but he turns so much stuff and he makes really great profits. So it's definitely a business model, you know, to be looked at if you don't have a lot of room. I'm listing more and more stuff on auction and starting because I really like that idea of moving it out, moving it out. Now, his specialty is guy stuff, uh, pens and knives and cookware and man stuff, you know, electronics. And it was really funny when him and I go shopping together, noticing he's looking at a certain kind of stuff and I'm looking at something completely different. And we both notice it. We both like pass by stuff. And we Then we watch the other person go, I'm like, I knew you were going to go look at that. So... Uh, one of the things that we went to this this estate sale that was really high end Asian art and porcelain, and they had uh, a lot of really high end glass, Waterford and Steuben, really good names. The you know the the, the make Danny drool names, and there was a piece there uh, sitting over by itself in a presentation box large large piece of Steuben glass it was priced at hundred and ninety dollars which absolutely great price uh, he asked me you know what do you think on this piece I said yeah my gut says grab it um, Steuben and large piece can't go wrong um, we couldn't find we couldn't pull it up on the eBay app we I mean we looked everywhere finally I found some on the Terapeak app and I just like Oh yeah, buy this. Um, he ended up getting that piece and a, uh, a Steuben apple and a Waterford ashtray. Um, he got some really nice pieces negotiated down to I think about $200 for, for all three pieces, which is great. I loved watching him negotiate. And uh, when we left there, we... we we were talking about how the Steuben piece, anybody want to take a guess what this Steuben piece is going to sell for? Now, mind you, it's a big piece called the Ice Hunter. Very intricate. It's an iceberg with a little guy in a kayak, and there's a seal coming up in the water. Very intricate piece. So Sherry says about 1000 Nick says 250 1200 Would you guys believe it's a five? thousand dollar piece five thousand dollars we found uh, a few of them that have sold in the past serious we found one that sold for four thousand without the box and I found a, I found two that sold in the five thousand dollar range with the box that's a payday that is a payday and I tell you what guys I know everybody here would buy a $200 piece that they could flip for 5000 Am I right? Is there anybody who would not spend $200 on a piece you could flip for 5000 Anybody? Who wants a $4,000 payday every week? 
to list one item. One item. One item. You guys, we can do this. This stuff is out there. It's out there. But we have to stop buying the $20 items and save up that $200 that, you know, we bought 200 items at a dollar each thinking like, but look at all the work involved. When you can go out and buy a $200 piece that'll sell for four or $5,000. You can do this. You just got to set your mind to it. I know. It's crazy. So at that same estate sale, I got a few little... Now, I didn't want to buy a whole bunch because I was still having to come home. But what I did get, being this was all really high-end stuff at the sale, they had all these little... Now, I'm showing you the back end of this one. Let me show you the front end of this one. Here we go. So these are cloisonne. Cloisonne little trinket boxes. And I got one here with the dragons... Now these all have their original price tags on them that are $40 and up. They were priced at $5 each. So in the scope of things at this estate sale, with things that were priced you know, in the $100, $200 range, this was a cheap collectible to them. But I got five of these. I'm starting them all on auction at $9.95 each, and they should sell in the $30 to $40 range because they're... <laughs> I got I got competition in the background. <laughs> They're all going to sell for thirty to forty dollars a piece. Maybe some of them twenty five, um, but that's a good payday for me. Then I'm still thinking, gosh, I'd much rather list one item and get four thousand. Still really good stuff. Cloisonne, older vintage cloisonne. Cloisonne is a brass that has been uh, inlaid with enamel. Let's see if I can get close enough. You guys can get a good look at one of these and see what that looks like. Um, they're usually a turquoise blue on the inside. Almost everyone I've seen has been like this turquoise blue. So something to look for. All right. Um, something else I got, we stopped at one more estate sale that was in like a little warehouse thing. And this is that bowl. Um, now, if anybody knows anything about this turquoise blue pottery bowl, sure love to know because I don't have a clue. I just knew it's old, it's vintage, it's turquoise, it's got a seven on the bottom. That's all I know. I got to do a little research. So if anybody knows, help me out there. So I paid five bucks for that. I also got this neat little... EAPG, which is Early American Press Glass Trinket Box for five bucks. Um, beaded Circle is the pattern on this. Not a really huge seller, but it's right up my alley, and I should be able to list this for about 50 bucks. I got a Mortar and Pestle. Mortar and Pestles are really good sellers. Now, this one was really different because it's not a solid end. It's more like a mixing thing. I'd never seen one like it. So I picked that up for five bucks. It's got a neat little pattern. It's brass and heavy. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what this one does. So, but mortar and pestles, really good sellers. There's people that, that collect these and they go for good money. I thought this piece was really interesting and I bought it because I wanted to tell you guys something. This is a piece off of an old um, oil lamp. The oil lamp would have sat in here and it would have been mounted to the wall. You know, this is the wall mount. So what would you guys call this little guy right here? What would you refer to that as? No, it's not a snail. A fish. It looks like a fish, doesn't it? So... Okay, so you guys are ahead of me because you already know this, but I want everybody to know this. When you are listing an antique, and this is in glass, um, this one happens to be brass, this is known as dolphin. It's known as a dolphin for some reason. I don't know why that is, but always use the term dolphin with a little piece that, that has this guy. You can use fish too, um, but collectors that pay the money know this is dolphin. Now, um, this piece was five bucks, and I couldn't find one exactly like it, but I found 
similar. Actually, I found just the dolphin guy without this piece sold for 40 something dollars. So this should do pretty good. So don't be afraid to pick up pieces and parts of an antique because people are looking for pieces and parts. I know, and I'm running over tonight, guys, because I just had such a crazy good week, but I wanted to get that all in. All right. So uh, we're going to wrap it up to my appsters out there who are part of my membership. Uh, we meet tomorrow for our Danny Mapster class. Uh, we're going through and creating our goals and plans for our eBay businesses. We call it the Danny Map. Um, the, Danny, the Danny Appsters are part of my membership. And what you get with that is we meet, actually we now meet twice weekly. On Mondays we have our specialty class where we're doing our business planning. And on Wednesdays we have a free-for-all where you just ask questions and you get to see my computer screen and how I actually go through processes and research and find things and list things and do things. Um, and I give those um, real-life examples of, of how to do stuff. So it's... Uh, you can find all the info and I'm looking to see um, if April will put up the link for the dannyapp.com where you can go find information on uh, becoming an appster. Uh, other than that, meet us over on the Facebook group. Tons of people over there with great knowledge can help you identify things. Uh, we have a different thread going every day to kind of keep things fun and motivating because uh, I know this can kind of get to be uh, old and a uh, mundane chore to go through all these tasks every day. But we keep it fun. Keep it exciting. Come on over to the Facebook group. And let's have some fun over there. And uh, make tons of money. That's what it's all about. Is making tons of money. And we all want to do that. I don't think anybody here would say they don't want to make money, right? Yeah. I don't even, that's rhetorical. All right, guys. We're going to wrap it up. I will see you all next week. Touch over on the Facebook group. Have a fantastic week. Oh, and happy Valentine's Day. Have a great one. Bye, everyone. <laughs>